question. Well, the, the question was about the silly, the silly question you've been getting about why put a novel in the past at a time before the internet, because the internet would have solved all these characters' problems and made them omniscient. And um, I, and I, I was just mentioning that I, I find myself having trouble penetrating the sort of perversity and, and stupidity of that question. And it seems it seems like the question itself uh, captures something about our time. Uh, I agree, but I uh, my editor has advised me not to answer like that. <laughs> 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 okay, good. So I have to say things like, well, things happened before you were born. <laughs> Rumor has. Uh, 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 before you were alive, there were other people and things happened. <laughs> and um, the thing that also uh, that bothers me is that uh, this book is um, a search for this young woman's origins. And all she knows from the beginning is from her adoptive mother, that she was born in a displaced persons camp, there Bergen Belsen after the war, and her mother's name is Maria G. And so this young person who was writing about the book said, Well, if you know, if this guy had had the internet, you know, in, in ten minutes he would know everything. He could do a biopic about this woman. Well, I don't think so. Um, I dare you to type in Bergen Belsen. Maria G. <laughs> and, and find out. It's, um, it's a kind of narcissism about our time uh, that somehow the internet has redefined reality in such a way that other, other realities don't exist, that there wasn't a world before this. I think, as you say, you, know, you scan the world, but you don't really read. You don't think. You know, there's also just the attraction of writing about sending San Francisco. Right. I mean, in, in and of itself is worth writing about. You don't have to you know, justify for any experience. But you like to comparison between you know, where it is now in terms of uh, gentrification and you know, that sort of stuff. And um, uh, one of the things I, uh, I loved about the book is how it kind of uh, captured that feeling of dread and sort of grittiness at that time, with the you know, Zodiac Killer, the Zebra Killer, Patty Hearst, um, you know, all this sort of insanity going on around that time. And I think that's something that, uh, you know, with, over the years, as, as wealth accumulates and new technologies and certain industries come around, people forget uh, that there is, you know, there was there's this, this history uh, to the city. It was, a, I arrived here in 1972 when I was a child. And, uh, <laughs> And I just thought, where have I, come? Where have I landed? You know, um, I had I'd gone to school in central New York State at Cornell, and it's an idyllic place, earthy nose, a gorgeous uh, hillsides. Mm -hmm. And I came here, and I went, where have I landed? Um, it was uh, gritty. Uh, we were in the middle of the stagflation, so the entire country's economy was very depressed, they had to create the word stagflation. You know, theoretically, there could be inflation um, or stagnation, but suddenly we had both at the same time. Uh, yes, the zebra killings, uh, Zodiac, Patty Hearst. I mean, shortly after the period of this book, uh, Mayor Moscone was murdered by Dan White. Uh, Dan White got off on the infamous, now infamous Twinkie defense. Uh, they wore the, uh, the knights, of, they called the White Knights, mm -hmm. where uh, uh, the gay community went down and tore up parking meters and burned cars in front of City Hall. This went on for three or four nights. Um, it was a very strange time here. And uh, I've met younger people who say, oh, it must have been so groovy to live through the 70s. And you go, well, not so much. Random killings are so groovy. <laughs> <laughs> what was the Twinkie defense? What was the Twinkie defense? Oh, okay. Uh, Dan White, um, you know, walked. I mean, he had this. Uh, he had been passed over for various assignments. He was a supervisor. Uh, Moscone was the mayor. He was gay. He was the first no, no, gay. No, 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 no. You're doing close. Oh, yeah. There's Moscone. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No. Right. Yeah, no, no, I'm sorry. Yes, I definitely screwed this up. Thank you. Or revealed something. I revealed something. Yes, <laughs> yeah, you, you heard it here first. Right. Uh, the, tw uh, the Twinkie defense. Uh, Dan White um, 
lawyer, <coughs> that he had been eating all these sweets, and that he had been consuming, and he had been crazy, and he'd been Twinkies, and the list of all this, like, sweet, and he got off, that he was somehow chemically rearranged. Uh, and he assassinated the mayor and the supervisor. I'm sorry, the mayor supervisor. And the supervisor. Yes, Harvey Milton. Hence the upset. Yes, hence the upset. But the, yeah, begin with that, though, both of them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> As I say, though, in, in, in the novel, though, there's that great sense of, of uh, because of that, the atmosphere in this, in, in, in this book, there's this wonderful uh, uh, sense of noir I think, yeah, throughout, throughout the whole piece. Um, and it's, uh, it's kind of coming back to your first point when you're talking about how, you know, with books, it is that, uh, that connection, that uh, intelligence meets an intelligence. And um, in, in, this, in this novel, you sort of foster that by, I think, doing a couple of things. One, by making it very atmospheric and almost uh, sort of a cloistered feeling of this, you know, San Francisco is in many ways an island with all its different little patches and, and, uh, and crenellations. But also, uh, in, the, in the novel, you really, it may, maybe it's just, it's just, maybe because it just stood out, but it seemed like you really, um, maybe because there were so many instances of it, or the instances that were there were striking, uh, but it seems you really focused on the auditory. That is to say, um, uh, telling the story a lot through what, what is heard and overheard. It's like a radio program. And that really heightens the sense of intimacy, I thought, in, in the novel. And I was wondering, is that something you did, um, I'm guessing, on purpose? Um, I, I uh, had a, a writing office. I still have it in a building that's very much like the one described in the book. Um, and it's not that weird. A lot of it is the narrator's perception. But there were two thin doors on either side. And one night I was sitting there, and I could hear everything coming from the next office. It was a matchmaking service. <laughs> <laughs> and I could hear the matchmaker come in and introduce these two people and their halting attempts to the conversation. And I was like, whoa, this is awfully weird. But again, should I like let them know I'm here? Or? And you didn't let them know. I did. The next day, actually, I went to the woman who ran the business. I said, you know, I can hear everything. And she said, oh, yeah, we know that. We're moving in about a month. Don't worry about it. <laughs> so the situation presented itself. Uh, and, but I have to say, I, I resisted it. I thought mm -hmm. this was a, an insane thing to do, try to tell a story where you can't describe the characters, that they only live in his imagination, that he has to interpret them from their accents and their cadence and uh, tone of voice and identify them that way. Matter of fact, he resists knowing what they look like. Mm -hmm. And it, he says, um, they were like uh, characters in a novel. You know, They have their own particular space in your mind without being actually detailed. And so he wants to keep them like that. He, he thinks if he actually sees uh, the patient and the doctor, mm -hmm. that it will somehow diminish the imagination he has of them. So, as I say, I, it's, it's a crazy thing to try to do. Um, next time I write a book, <laughs> whoever's telling it will be able to see what's around. <laughs>